on. Sure. I'd be fine with putting it on YouTube. I, I don't know if anybody else has any. I think yeah, it would be okay. It's fine. I just started recording. So you, did, you okay, get, did you get a notification? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay great. Uh, how about I give a brief introduction okay. and then we get going? Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, cool. So everybody, thank you so much for coming. This is uh, um, not our normal time for this. And people, well, we've got a ton of people from uh, all over the place, it looks like. Um, and thank you so much, uh, so much, Smita, for agreeing to do this. It's, it's 10.05, 10.06 uh, for you there in New Haven, Connecticut. So uh, everybody, this is uh, Smita Krishnaswamy. And she's an assistant professor in genetics and computer science. Uh, she's affiliated with the Applied Math Program, Computational Biology Program, and uh, the, through the Yale Center for Biomedical Data Science and Yale Cancer Centers. Uh, she has a PhD in computer science and engineering. Um, I think everyone <laughs> should mute themselves. Yeah, can everybody mute themselves? <laughs> she has a PhD in computer science and engineering from the University of uh, Michigan where she worked on algorithms for robust design and probabilistic verification of large logic networks. Uh, you previously held a postdoc at Columbia, right? I did. I was a uh, postdoc with Donna, Donna Pierre at Columbia University. Back when she right. Was and, uh, and has given talks on machine learning and graph signal processing, uh, kind of uh, a very specific kind that she'll talk about today called manifold, uh, manifold learning uh, at a variety of places, including Microsoft Research, which is available on YouTube, which is where I first became aware of you. Yeah, I actually uh, didn't know that was on YouTube, but that's okay. And your work it is. <laughs> um, so her focus is on unsupervised machine uh, learning methods, uh, specifically manifold learning and deep learning techniques for detecting structure and patterns in data. Um, so she'll be talking about that today. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It's really cool. Yeah, no problem. You know, I, actually this t timing works out perfectly because my kids are almost asleep. So <laughs> with COVID, it works out well. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen. Did that? Okay, let me try. Is this working? That, that does work. It's like perfect. Slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Um, th thank you, from Michael, for uh, contacting me. It's uh, fun to speak to a pretty interdisciplinary group. So because it'll, it'll be curious to see if people um, synergize with their work or there's certain parts of the tools and things like that that um, connect with them. Um, so I'll be talking about a lot of the work in my lab, um, which broadly speaking is about detecting structure and patterns in biomedical data and most specifically big biomedical data where you have a lot of different observations. Um, but, but having said that, I don't think there's anything that's super specific in, in my techniques that can only be applied to bi biomedical data. It's basically techniques for whenever you have um, a lot of features, a lot of observations, a lot of heterogeneity, and a lot of noise. Um, and so um, feel free to see if you can apply to or try to extend it to your own fields. Um, our, our own lab, we've applied it to many types of biomedical data that don't have that much in common with each other. I, um, so we started out, my lab started about five years ago here at Yale, and this was when single cell RNA sequencing was coming out. The thing that's very exciting about single cell RNA sequencing for somebody interested in finding patterns in big data is it's extremely big in both directions. It, you have um, the transcriptomic profile, meaning which RNA uh, molecules your cell is expressing um, in all the dimensions of the genes that exist in the cell. So it's 20,000 or more dimensions and many observations. Initially, there were more dimensions than observations, so it would be a few thousand, but now there's many more observations and even data sets with a million observations. So this uh, motivated a lot, a lot of very interesting um, mathematical problems and data science problems, uh, which when you solve, you gain a lot of different insights and uh, about a lot of different, uh, uh, about how to gain information from data. Um, more recently, there ha there's an even higher dimensional data type called single cell ataxy, where you can understand all of the parts of the chromatin that are open. So this is epigenetic is, data. 
Um, there's in, in the biomedical realm, there has been fMRI or functional MRI data, uh, which people also measure um, for psychological reasons, um, where the unit of measurement is voxels, but um, there's high resolution fMRI where you have um, a million voxels in, in somebody's brain measured in, um, in, measured in time. Um, and finally, a new kind of data set that we've been using is patient data. And you, patient data can come in all flavors. It can be patients talking to doctors and their notes. It can be lab values. It can be continuous monitoring like heart rate. Um, it can be genetics. Um, and so these are, these are all types of big biomedical data that, that we've sort of looked at. I'll largely be talking or showing results on the single cell RNA, RNA sequencing work because it's, that's, that's a little bit um, more mature. But basically when I talk about big data, um, I am talking about data where the dimensionality is very high, so people don't have natural intuition and in high dimensionality. It doesn't take too many dimensions because we can only see in three. So if you have something five dimensional already, it's a little bit beyond uh, our intuitive capabilities. So these technologies uh, that we are currently dealing with in the biomedical field, but also any other field where you're taking a lot of um, data about people um, can be hundreds to hundreds of thousands of dimensions. Um, to just a dozen maybe, but nevertheless, um, it can pose problems for people to understand what the structure of the data is. A lot of this data is very noisy because of measurement artifact, machine calibration, differences from lab to lab to hospital to hospital. Um, and because it's so high dimensional, there can also, it, it can also be very sparse. There can be a lot of uh, dropout. Um, and finally, just the sheer amount of data there is can pose problems as far as the scale goes. So these are all challenges that we've worked on addressing in my lab. And it's interesting because once you figure out some way of addressing these challenges, there's a lot of exciting stuff that can come out. Uh, sometimes things that you didn't necessarily think that you'd be able to learn from data, for example, um, a lot of biomedical data is by construction static. So if you measure a bunch of cells, now they're all dead, you can't measure them anymore. You just got that one static snapshot. Sometimes population data can be that way too. You, you, know, you get patients who come in for a flu shot and then they leave and you don't track them anymore. You just have one snapshot. Turns out you can learn a lot of dynamics from, the, from static snapshot data if you have a lot of it. Um, visualizing uh, data is how you solve the dimensionality problem. You can distill it down to two dimensions and then you can gain a lot of insight about what your data is structured like and what further analysis you want to do. You can indeed impute or denoise data and um, fill in the trends and the structure again. And you can compare large uh, cohorts of patients or, or data points that are very structured. And the unifying principle that we use um, in tackling all of these data science challenges and turning them into data science opportunities is um, what I call manifold learning. Um, when I'm talking about manifold learning in the data science sense, um, we're talking about a smoothly varying locally Euclidean uh, seeming space uh, where that's much lower dimensional than your ambient space. So the ambient space can be, as I mentioned, 20,000 dimensional, but often the intrinsic uh, dimensionality of the data is much lower, especially when you're looking at nonlinear dimensionality. So if you have a dimensionality reduction method or a dimensionality discovery method when you can discover the intrinsic nonlinear dimensions of the data, you'll discover that the data has a lot of structure and the data is in much lower dimensions than, than your ambient space. And actually learning what these coiled dimensions are and, um, and how you would restore your data to the main dimensions, nonlinear dimensions, is um, a large part of my work, which then leads to being able to solve things like noise um, or dimensionality reduction. So how do we learn this 
um, nonlinear structure of the data that, that can be much lower dimensional than the measurement space. Uh, we use two main techniques to learn it. Um, one set of techniques is roughly graph spectral, also using graph signal processing. And the main idea here is that um, you can have data in however many dimensions, uh, but you distill that into a graph by measuring distances between all pairs of points. Um, once you have this graph, you try to localize this graph so that you get very local connections. And the reason is because whatever distance metric you're using, um, it's not specifically along the manifold because you haven't discovered the data manifold yet or the shape of the data yet. And so what you really want to do is only connect the nearest neighbors to each other. And when you connect the nearest neighbors to each other, you start to form a structure that resembles the structure of the data. Now, once you're on this nearest neighbor type of graph, if you take a walk along this graph, you get manifold intrinsic distances between data points. So initially you might've thought that this point was very close to this point because of um, your distance measure, which could be, for example, Euclidean distance. But once you localize this, these connections by passing it through a kernel that converts the distance into affinity, um, then you only get localized connections and now walks on this will give you manifold intrinsic distances and uh, you can calculate the intrinsic uh, dimensions of the manifold using that. Another uh, class of methods that we use are neural network embeddings. So we use neural networks in an unsupervised fashion a lot in my lab. Um, we almost never focus specifically on classification, but rather the embedding or the encoding that the neural network, for example, an autoencoder here is learning in a lower dimensional space. And we use different ways of regularizing or penalizing this embedding so that we can interpret it uh, in different ways. So it gives us representations with different qualities. I'm going to go over uh, one example of this later. We have other works um, that I can share with you uh, if you're interested. Um, just, just chat with me about other forms of regularization that give other representations within um, the neural network context. Um, so what kind of got us all started with this was uh, the very first challenge that I started to tackle um, when I first started my faculty position. This was the idea that um, I really wanted to understand uh, if we could learn gene regulatory networks from single cell RNA sequencing data. But it turned out that I really couldn't tell anything about the relationship between genes because there was so much uh, noise in the data. And it was a very specific kind of noise. And when we set out to solve this, uh, we discovered this whole world of um, diffusion-based data manifold learning, which helped us solved this problem and then gave us this fundamental tool. So I'm going to explain this to you. Um, so the problem was as follows. We basically got these large matrices from this very exciting new kind of data where you're measuring the transcriptional program of each single cell. So now you might think I can learn a lot about which gene is interacting to which other gene because your cells are some kind of complex information processing network. Um, but it turned out that that wasn't really the case. And the reason is because imagine this is the count matrix where the red is high count and the blue is low count, what you actually get is not actually this matrix. You get some kind of sample from this matrix where you um, are just sort of randomly sampling and you might get something like this. And now uh, you might not have sampled any transcripts corresponding to um, two different genes that you're interested in talking uh, if, to see if they're co-expressed, they're interacting, they're talking to each other in some way at all in, um, in any of the same cell. So if two genes are never expressed in the same cell, then any measure like correlation won't work. Um, and having just come off of publishing a, a science paper on looking at these relationships and how they vary in time in proteomic data, uh, this, this was somewhat disappointing, uh, but once we discovered how we could deal with this challenge, it gave us a bunch of opportunities. So you might think of, so one of the first um, things you can do is you, you can try to imagine how 
all of these transcripts are uh, collected. So there's a cell. The cell is broken open by lysis, and then there is a primer that captures some amount of RNA molecules and leaves the rest in the cell. Um, and this might be kind of a simplistic way of thinking about it for a biologist, but it really helped us think that this actually uh, was not a missing value problem as some people treated it. Uh, I did not have, I don't have to distinguish or think which is a real zero and which is really uh, missing, but rather treating it as a noise. So if you think back about uh, what you might know about noise, you might have heard of low rank approximation. The low rank approximation is this idea, you take this data matrix, you perform SVD and you pick um, some amount of the singular vectors and you recreate it. And the idea is you take off the singular vectors with low singular values because they probably constitute noise. And this is, was pretty well established, especially in the image processing context, where you can take off noise um, from images. And the main idea here is that the real signal in the data is smooth, but the noise is sort of jumpy. So if you look at the main axes of variation of this image, it's going to reflect the smooth part of it and the um, kind of pockmarkedness, which makes one pixel very different from another pixel, you can get rid of by um, taking off the low eigenvalued eigenvectors from, from PCA as they did in this, this plot. So if you actually try that on um, data that actually has very strong nonlinearity, as we saw that um, a lot of biomedical data has, um, it actually doesn't work well. And the reason is because if you look at the low rank approximation column and you look at the original data and you've added noise, if you add noise along the coiled dimension, um, PCA or SVD can't pick that up. It's not going to pick up noise in this coiled dimension. It'll just try to take off planes of planes or higher dimensional linear spaces in your system. So your data is going to be left noisy. So we needed definitely something um, nonlinear. And so the nonlinear method that we um, converged towards uh, was inspired by diffusion maps. So here the idea is you have a cell by gene matrix. So if you have a cell by gene matrix, you can turn that into a cell by cell distance matrix. And then we pass, we pass it through an adaptive Gaussian kernel to give us affinity. So you can see that in this Swiss roll, um, at the main axis has high affinity. So each point has high affinity with its uh, near neighbor along the roll, but it also has some affinity with things on other bands of the coil, uh, which is not going to give you uh, proper uh, denoising. And so what we realized was if we can improve this affinity matrix by diffusion. And the way we do that is Markov normalize the affinity matrix. So make every row add up to one, as is shown here, and power the matrix so that is um, going to give you a diffused affinity matrix that is reflective of connections within the manifold because uh, you've connected every point to every other point uh, by probabilistic paths uh, within T, T steps. So uh, if you want to step back for a moment, this is the Markov affinity matrix, which is also called a diffusion operator and diffusion maps, which were developed in 2006, actually by my colleague Rafi Koifman, um, it are the eigenvectors of this matrix. So this is a form of kernel PCA where you're taking these uh, eigenvectors of the diffusion matrix. Um, and if you diffuse, basically it changes the eigenvalues and, and not the eigenvectors. And um, it turns out that these also have this kind of long range variation versus short range variation type interpretation, but it's even strong, it's even a little bit stronger in the sense that these eigenvectors are actually frequency harmonics because they're the same vectors that are in a Laplacian, which is a second derivative operator and eigenvectors of second derivatives are, are harmonics. Uh, and here you have the second eigenvector of a diffusion map showing you a low frequency trend on this fake grid graph, just as a matter of illustration. 
And um, you see the 10th eigenvector is a little bit higher frequency. And then the second to last eigenvector varies very fast. And you see this here on the line graph. The uh, second eigenvector u2 is just making one period through the line. Um, and then you have the purple u4 making two periods. And then you have u64 actually looking like an envelope because it just jiggles up and down and up and down. Um, so actually, we can very explicitly take off high frequency noise uh, from single cell data along the graph, whatever the graph shape is. But luckily, we've made the graph shaped, along, shaped in the way the data is shaped. So in this way of thinking, which is very prevalent in graph signal processing, which is a field that's just been developing the last three, four years, uh, that some of you might be familiar with, um, you're trying to create a structure uh, on which to process signals in unstructured data, like these cells. And the main way you do it is you create a graph between these and you treat features of the vertices, like genes, as signals on this graph and um, you can process these signals um, in analogous ways as you process audio uh, and, and image signals um, in space and time. Um, and so the graph signal processing terminology of eigen decomposing the affinity matrix or equivalently the graph Laplacian is that you're taking a graph Fourier transform. Um, so you have these signals on a graph. This is in the vertex domain. Now you can transfer it to the frequency domain and back and forth. Um, and this gives you the frequency uh, loading of a particular signal, which in our context is the value of a gene on our graph. So of course, if you change the connectivity of your graph, your frequencies all change too, because this is based on the substrate of the graph. Um, and so we use um, graph signal processing, um, a graph signal processing technique here to denoise this data. And the way we do this is uh, we create a filter of these um, loadings by exponentiating this matrix, which right raises every eigenvalue to the power of t. And you came up with a soft low pass filter uh, rather than a hard cutoff that you would get with the low rank approximation, which worked out better for us. And then when you load this back, each cell, the value for each cell, the value of a gene uh, is corrected as the weighted average of its diffusion neighbors. So in the vertex domain, you're getting something smoother and smoother along the neighborhoods because you're taking a weighted average, um, not just of its neighbors, but prominently weighting the neighbors more. In the frequency domain, you're doing exactly what you would expect a low pass filter to do, which is it's killing high frequency noise. Um, and that's basically what um, magic is. It's a manifold um, denoising method. Um, and so what is, you, you can notice that this parameter T is very important. If you raise T very high, you'll miss a lot of the information. If you keep T low, then you might leave around noise. So uh, here T is taking the place of how many uh, singular vectors would I use to denoise the data. So you can see that um, as, so in my original quest to understand how genes were related to each other, um, we had so many values just near the axis that we couldn't understand these relationships. But as you denoise the data more and more using higher and higher T's, you get more distinct shapes that are nonlinear because it's capturing the nonlinear relationship between uh, the data points. Um, and, and what is actually magic imputing? It's imputing actually transcripts. It's, there were transcripts that were missing that you imputed. So it's going to correct that entire gene, gene count matrix. But the question of which T should we use is, is still there. Um, and one of the answers that we had were, if you look at how fast the matrix changes, basically how fast are the data points learning from diffusing these values to each other, you initially get a phase where there's rapid change and then it stabilizes. And we uh, did notice that shortly after it stabilizes, 
is a good value. Recently, there's been another paper that has a different method. So this method um, uses single cell data to pick T for magic. Um, and what it does is it has some noise cells that are created as a just a combination of all the other cells. It artificially spikes them in and looks at the T it needs to get rid of those. So I think there could be many, many different heuristics and this is sort of the standard kind of question, how many eigenvectors, what, what, what should the extent of low pass filtering be? Um, but we did notice that magic uh, recovers gene gene relationships uh, even if you had uh, severe dropout on your data. And not only that, there was no assumptions on what the noise should be, whether it should be dropout or not. So we can create clean other kinds of noise too. So you often get a cleaner matrix uh, than, than before. Um, and because I uh, set, set it up by motivating it with lower rank approximation, we can see that this actually um, does better than lower rank approximation in picking out known nonlinear, non-monotonic relationships. Um, and, and so matrix completion, which um, looks at certain zeros as missing values, probably performs the, the worst here. Um, and so once we had magic, we were able to look at pretty exciting biomedical systems. So one of the systems that uh, I use a lot is uh, in collaboration with actually Melbourne native um, Christine Schaefer, who's at the Garvin Institute in Sydney now. Um, she was in Bob Weinberg's lab at the time I met her, and since then she's started her own lab and she studies the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So this is, um, thought to recapitulate a part of the transition that happens in your in a person's body when their cancer metastasizes. Um, so initially, you would have some epithelial cell type in breast cancer, where your breast cancer cells have this nice structure. They're uh, flat. They're adherent, um, and they kind of form a sheet like epithelial cells form. These cells have to undergo a lot of different changes before they can uh, become mobile, detached from each other, swim through your body, and form another metastatic colony. Um, and this was a system that was um, pr pretty um, in intriguing because this is, forms the most fatal aspect of cancer. And here, uh, what we discovered was we could tell which genes regulate which which other genes much better, even with these static measurements, uh, which we've since improved on, but um, I'll show you the idea. The idea is we have a culture of breast cancer cells. We artificially stimulate it to undergo the, uh, the EMT transition. Uh, several days later, you have cells in all phases of this transition. So for example, day eight has cells in the early epithelial phase, which is marked by high E cadherin and late phase where it's completely mesenchymal and marked by vimentin. So if you take um, cells here, you can get an idea of what is going on throughout this entire transition. And again, the data initially looks like it's all on the origin, uh, but after magic, you're able to tell what the continuum of cells looks like. And most specifically, one thing that surprised us a little bit was that there's only a small fraction of cells that actually make it to the mesenchymal phase. The vast majority are stuck here. We were able to characterize a lot of the cells in this intermediate state where some of the cells have very interesting stem-like characteristics. Um, and we're also able to learn what certain uh, genes turn on um, in each cell to create kind of a rolling ball transition. So it seems like all the, most of the cells that go here uh, end up finishing the transition. So for this, um, we chose to improve a technique that I originally developed in my postdoc uh, called Dreamy along with a visualization called Dreavy. So you have two genes and usually the problem in biology is that you have so many samples from one part of the relationship that you can't understand the entire relationship. So this is really a question of separating the density from the geometry. And so this keeps coming up 
over and over again when I study biomedical data, but maybe you, in your data sets too. How do you separate the geometry of the data or understand the geometry of the data separate from the density? Because it gives you different information. So in order to do this, uh, what we ended up doing was changing from visualizing the joint probability to visualizing the conditional probability. And now on this, on this um, re representation here, we compute mutual information. Um, and this is a metric that I call dreamy. So it's double conditioned. And this double conditioning gives you the idea of the full strength of the relationship, even if very few cells are here in, as far as expression goes. So using a combination of um, the place in the trajectory where we think the cells are with the dreamy, we were able to uncover the network. So here we've ordered the cells in increasing order of vimentin, which we took as a proxy for where in the transition they are. And then a big regulator of EMT was Zeb. And we were able to show that of these genes, the ones that have high dreamy, um, and are turned on after Zeb in this transition um, are cells that actually are regulated by Zeb. And um, Christine and her colleagues performed an experiment that helped us understand this by directly inducing Zeb instead of TGF beta. And we found that the genes that we predicted ranked high relative to the other genes that are induced by TGF beta directly. So that, um, that was very interesting for us to see and um, introduced us to um, sort of a world of using graph signal processing and manifold learning to understand uh, about pretty complex biomedical systems. Um, but, um, and it gave us the idea of really understanding how to compare data sets. So here I, I talked to you a little bit about two different data sets there were. There is a TGF beta stimulation and a ZEB stimulation. Um, here, in order to get these gene expression values, we, we measured these in bulk. But pretty soon, we started getting many conditions of single cell data like that in single cell. So if you're comparing two different single cell data sets, it's actually quite hard to compare. And a lot of people try to simplify this problem because they'll take the cellular manifold, they'll chop it up into some clusters and they'll say that one cluster or the other is overexpressed or underexpressed in different conditions. But that number is gonna strongly depend on how you cluster the data. So if there's a small part of a cluster that's over enriched, you might not see much of a difference. And so we realized that losing the single cell resolution here was a problem and that we could um, maybe start with some of the techniques we'd used in magic to develop a more principled method for looking at how um, single cell data sets themselves change as a result of different experimental conditions. Um, and so the main idea here is that you have a sample of your cells uh, from your cellular manifold. So again, uh, you have your data geometry, which is the cell state. In the control sample, you have some density over this data manifold. And then in the experimental sample, you have some other density and you want to know what the difference is. Um, understanding that the effect of the experiment is to alter density along this cellular state space somehow. Um, but these are very high dimensional objects. It's very hard to measure directly density uh, in these pretty high dimensions. Um, so once again, we saw a graph spectral or graph signal processing solution to this problem. The main idea we use here is to create a combined graph. So the control sample here is shown in beige, the experimental sample is shown in purple. Um, we combine and create a graph. You might have to batch normalize, but not talking too much about batch normalization here right now. Um, so you create a combined graph and initially, we start with a simple signal, which is a discrete signal, which just says which sample it came from. Control or experimental can be minus one, plus one, or zero, one. And here, what we want to do is we want to come up with a score for every location we can in the manifold. So 
we try to come up with a score for each cell state that we see on the basis of the cell that we sampled for how likely is it that cells in this neighborhood, in this particular neighborhood, would have come from the experimental condition versus the control condition. So this gives us a way of scoring the entire manifold. Um, so when we convert this um, discrete signal into a likelihood score that's continuous, you can see a trend in the data that's pretty clear that might not have been clear here. The idea is that this part, has, the cells have pretty high likelihood for coming from control. This part, the cells have pretty high likelihood for coming from the experimental condition, and here there's a transition. So the way we chose to perform this density estimate that actually em empirically worked out the best, but also um, makes some sense mathematically, is um, to cast this as an optimization problem, which avoids picking things like how big should your neighborhood be when you, when you compute this, and should that change? Um, and so the optimization problem that we gave it was, this is what we call the raw experimental signal. And we want to come up with an enhanced experimental signal that reconstructs this, but is also smooth on the manifold. And here's the graph Laplacian. Um, and we use uh, actually a modified graph Laplacian that allows us um, to derive a solution that comes from uh, heat diffusion. So this is basically a heat, heat kernel based low pass filtering that can be proven to be actually a density estimate on this. So the classic Laplacian regularization, the way you'd solve this is you'd set, uh, you take the derivative of this, set it equal to zero and solve it. And you can solve for Z and you get um, a filter that can be stated as a filter in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the Laplacian. And you can approximate that with Chebyshev polynomials to avoid the full decomposition. But we found that that was sometimes numerically unstable. So instead, we went the other way. We saw that heat kernels were well studied and led to kernel density estimation interpretations in a couple of different papers, the Botev paper in ambient space and the Koifman papers in graph space. Um, and we saw that if you slightly reformulated how you computed the Laplacian um, and renormalized it by the eigenvalue range that you're getting, then uh, you, you, you will get the solution as a heat kernel that has nice properties and is much more numerically stable. Um, and so this is what we use to filter the raw experimental sing signal into a likelihood of each cell being from control or experimental. And generally speaking, the meld score looks like a coloring on top of your data. We're drawing our data with fate, which I'll talk about ne um, next, but basically you can tell on fate where are the different populations that are different. That, that are looking different between the control and experimental. And so it's not based on clustering this data or anything like that. It's actually providing a score uh, on the entire manifold and you can maybe decide how many clusters there are of enrichment for the control or the experimental signal. And uh, we, the other advantage of this is because we smooth the raw experimental signal into an enhanced experimental signal that's continuous, you can use regression to figure out which genes are tracking with the experimental condition. And finally, we also did develop a clustering method that takes into account the frequency of the EES, as, uh, actually the frequency of the RES as well as the value of the EES to come up with clustering that was very tuned to the resolution at which the experimental differences are occurring. So it's not clustering a priori, but it's clustering using this signal and its frequencies. For example, here you see that the RES has very high frequency. Uh, high frequency RES can either mean that this is equally likely in experimental or control, mm, it, it, but if it also has a lower frequency component as this signal would because it's in the midst of this low frequency transition, 
you can see that this um, mid frequency will give it an interpretation that this is a transitional population. So the transitional population is characterized by a mid-level EES and um, a mid-frequency component, whereas this red dot is very high frequency and it has no mid-frequency component. And this is called a vertex frequency clustering, which is a type of clustering that's taking into account frequency of signals that are in, on, on the manifold. And this was published last year in, in 2019. The way the feature, the way the vertex frequency clustering actually works is it takes a windowed Fourier transform and now we've changed that into um, a wavelet transform at every vertex and you can see that vertices that are in the same sort of frequency domain for that signal split out and then we just run uh, k-means on it. So uh, how do we apply this? We apply this um, in many different circumstances for many different data sets, even within the uh, preprint paper that we have right now that's under revision. Um, so here we had T cells that were stimulated and unstimulated. And the T cells form a spectrum um, because they're all one cell type, but they can be in different states of activation. And after MELD, you get a good idea of what the difference is uh, in the different uh, phenotypic areas of the T cells. You can regress it to see which genes are driving these changes. And finally, just to show what the clustering does, um, here's a different example that we were showing. This is a um, zebrafish embryo. And um, one of our collaborators studies um, knocking out autism genes in zebrafish, um, which I still don't understand because they don't have a cortex. So why, why do they study autism in something without a cerebral cortex? But they still do. Um, so if you knock out cordon, um, you are thought to recapitulate uh, pre-autism uh, phenotype, and they were looking to see what the effect of that was. And they concluded it's this entire tail bud. And that's because they have these random clusters. And you can see when you look inside the tail bud that the EES values have a large range. And this is not very characteristic of something that would be from the cordon knockout. So we decided to zoom in with our EES and we can tell with our EES that cordon knockout only affects these so-called somites, um, these somites that are in blue. So it's actually only a small part of the tail bud. So we're able to offer more resolution into the results of their experiment um, because of that. So that, that, those were two forays into our graph signal processing realm. Uh, but meanwhile, as far as dimensionality reduction itself is concerned, um, it all, we created a method called FATE um, using some of these same principles. And that, those are the plots that I've been repeatedly showing you are these FATE plots. So um, we had to work very long and hard on FATE because it turns out that people are very attached to the way they visualize data. If you, people are visualizing data with PCA, they don't wanna use anything else. They're visualizing data with TSNE and you know, it's kind of uh, protege UMAP. They don't really want, want, want to change from that. So we ended up having to do 1200 comparisons, come up with a metric for what fate preserves, all sorts of things, get it published. And in the process, we're pretty confident in trying to ask you to try fate instead of TSNE and UMAP, uh, if, if you'd like. Um, so fate is trying to answer the question of how do you look at big data? If you, um, our answer is if you want to look at big data um, in a low dimensional form, we really want it to preserve the structure of the data, both the local structure and the global structure of the data, because we think that this gives very important information about naturalistic systems. Um, and so if you had this um, data set that was roughly shaped like this, um, so we created this fake tree and we sampled along here and we added noise and we rotated into high dimensions. We really want to see the structure again. Um, but PCA, um, so it's kind of projecting from the side here um, in a way that um, it's projecting it down to a plane where the purple and blue are sort of behind each other if you're looking at it from the side and the green and this green are behind each other, but it gives you something of the global structure, but it's missing out a lot of the local structure. TSNE feels free to shatter data uh, because its penalty is very strongly focused on preserving local neighbors. Um, same with UMAP. Um, 
and fate was designed to combat these issues explicitly by um, denoising the data so you can see the um, local characteristics and preserving global structure. So the way fate does this is um, like magic, which I was showing you, it computes these diffusion probabilities from one data point to every other data point in T steps. But instead of eigen decomposing here, uh, what we do is we take these as new features for cells. So now a cell has these new features that are its diffusion probability, T-step diffusion probability to every other cell. Um, so, so after that, we can come up with a distance between these new features. So it's kind of funny, we went from distance to affinity um, to diffusion probabilities, now back to a distance. So what is this new distance? This new distance is actually a divergence, and, we, and this is actually a very key step in fate. The reason is, if it wasn't a divergence and if it didn't have a damping factor like this log scale damping factor, then once again, the distance between two cells would be completely determined by uh, the difference in probabilities of their very near neighbors. And it would start looking very, very similar to t near or sometimes diffusion maps. Uh, instead, we're able to m have impact from things that are far from the cell. So long range diffusion probabilities, which we computed, we computed all the different diffusion probabilities. And so it stores it in this new kind of distance. And that, and that distance is squeezed to two dimensions using metric MDS, using classic MDS as a seed. So it's the same initialization for metric MDS. So when you do this, you do get both local and global structures. So PCA again, here is a data set of human embryonic stem cells that are developing. Um, so here you have uh, human embryonic stem cells that are identical from a cell culture. And if you let them uh, differentiate as embryoid bodies, these little balls, um, they start to differentiate into different lineages, including cardiac, hematopoietic, neural. I'm just gonna make the disclaimer that we're not eventually making a person with this, uh, but there are a lot of different cell types that arise. Um, and this was actually a question that somebody from the NIH had for me when I, when I wrote a grant on this. Um, so um, this was my collaborator, Natalia Ivanova, that collected this data. Um, and she harvested this culture of embryoid bodies that were growing into these cell types every three to six days. And we collected all that data and PCA uh, correctly shows that initially they were all one sort of cell type and then they diverged. So you see this triangular shape. Fate also gives you sort of a triangular shape, but it's picking up more of the fine details of the lineage branching. TSNI, on the other hand, is uh, not picking that up it, because it globally scrambles the data. The red cells that are basically the same cell type on, are on either sides of this. Diffusion maps, which were those eigenvectors of the diffusion operator that I showed you, they're pretty good, but they, um, preserve the trajectories in different dimensions. So diff diffusion dimension one is just this trajectory. Diffusion dimension two is this. And you'd have to look at a lot more diffusion dimensions. So they kind of separate out the components rather than squeeze them into two dimensions for visualization purposes. And so a quick way of saying it is uh, like PCA, FATE preserves um, global uh, variation but it also clarifies the local structure because as you saw the diffusion can can um, denoise and I, on top of fate you can because it preserves this structure there's a lot of kinds of analysis you, you can do you can uh, you can of course cluster the data and see if your clusters are sensible but you can also um, um, color it by intrinsic dimensionality or intrinsic or local density and or some of these kinds of things uh, to find branch points in the data or other uh, centers of the data um, and it's not limited to usage on any kind of single cell data. There's no assumptions about single cell. This is population genetics data from a data set called Thousand Genomes, which are people from all these different countries. So I know some of these countries are like Finland and things like that. And it shows the structure between that, that looks similar between you know, um, certain European countries and the connection between these different populations, whereas TSNI and UMAP tend to shatter, shatter it again so that you can't tell the connection between the different populations. Um, and the embryoid body comparison, just to show a few more methods, this is what TSNI looks like and this is what UMAP looks like. So they're disconnecting the data in, in different ways on different runs. 
Um, and so one of the disadvantages of that, even though it, you might be able to see some sort of cluster structure, is that you might not be able to tell how the transitions are happening in this kind of system where it's very connected. So whenever you're looking at a system with a lot of progression, you might want to think about that. Um, recently, we've had success um, of, of actually learning something about the dynamics of these systems. So clearly, when I'm talking about progression, I'm talking about dynamics. If this cell had lived longer, if I hadn't killed it, it would have gone down here and become maybe this cell, maybe that cell. Um, so it, the idea that fate is showing these progressions made us think that um, there that we might actually be able to learn it. So we did a couple of different projects to try to actually learn these dynamics or make a system that learns its dynamics. So of course, learning the dynamics just by itself as an ODE is pretty hopeless because of the number of dimensions. Instead, we were very inspired by the neural ODE framework that came out in 2018 from David Duvenod's lab, where the neural network actually learns a derivative and you have to integrate it to, in order to get the function and it gives you an uh, instantaneous derivative that it learns on the basis of irregularly sampled trajectories and it uses an ODE solver rather than using um, just normal you know SGD backprop. Um, so if you look at that same single cell data set you might um, see that you know you want to take these time points and maybe see how the population of cells flows from one to another to another. So you want some kind of differential equation that will morph these populations into these new populations, but also, for example, this cell should probably go down here, this cell should go down there. So in order to actually achieve that, uh, we um, added regularizations to come up with optimal transport for these cells. So how do we come up with optimal transport regularizations? The basic gist is to regularize or penalize the neural network for um, efficiency. So you don't want circuitous paths that go back and forth and side to side. You want pretty efficient paths along the data manifold. And the second uh, kind of regularization we had was that the local um, directions that the cells start to go have to agree with some data that uh, is already in there, which is the local velocity, which is found by which transcripts are new. So when we added these, we're able to actually make these cells continuously morph from one to another, even though our time granularity on these measurements is very low, we're able to simulate some kind of continuous time trajectory on this. Um, so coming back to the story that I had um, about these epithelial to mesenchymal cells, so uh, we contacted Christine again and she showed her this data and she actually thought it would be really interesting to figure out some mysteries about the reverse process, the zenchymal to epithelial transition. And the reason this process exists is because when your cells metastasize and swim to a new location, they have to be mesenchymal, but in order to reform the tumor, they go back to being epithelial. And again, it was not clear what are the cells that are completing these transitions. So Christine actually gave us four different data points, uh, 48 hours, 12 days, 18 days, and 30 days. We ran it through our network, which we call TrajectoryNet. Um, and interestingly, so uh, we gave it a couple of different um, ways of escaping having to move everything. The first was this energy regularization, and the second is we allow unbalanced transport. So a combination of these uh, actually gives transport paths for cells, and we noticed something very interesting. If you look at the 48 hours, it's not the entire population that's transporting, it's only the small part, part of this population that's transporting. And so we tried to zoom in on what was special about this part of the transport. And we actually find some interesting signals there that Christine is now studying further and actually got permission to, to remeasure. Um, and so we see uh, very interesting characteristics about the cell cycle, for example. And not only that, we can actually go back and treat these cells as continuously changing entities and look to see time trends of the genes. So, um, so with this, we're hoping to really figure out the identity of the cells that go back and form the metastatic tumor, which would be very interesting. Uh, the final project I'm gonna talk about is how to scale this all up, because I mentioned to you that scalability is a bottleneck, and this really motivates our use of neural networks. Um, so all the analysis that I did, visualization, uh, denoising, um, and even batch correction, uh, we, uh, 
basically made a neural network that can do most of that. And the reason we did that was because we were really motivated by this data set. We had this data set of 180 different patients who had dengue in India. And one question that, that our collaborator had was, why don't most of these people get Zika? And she later published a paper on, on Zika. So when we were looking at these patient populations, it was just too many cells. There were 20 million cells because we had a huge single cell mass cytometry data set on each patient. And they all had batch effect. So batch effect means when the patient populations are just disjointed or unaligned from each other. Uh, the reason is because of measurement error and maybe shipping all the way, these blood samples all the way from India, God knows what that does to these um, cellular populations. So in order to do that, we made an autoencoder that's very tricked out, I'll say. It has um, different layers that perform different of these tasks. And how do they perform it? By creating different representations that uh, have that task done. And the four different ones are uh, cell type identification, unsupervised, so clustering, visualization, and actually the same kind of imputation that I talked about. And the way this is done is by regularizing in different ways. So um, in our regularization, in our regularizations, if we really want to see the cluster subtyping structure of this data, we introduce a information dimension regularization and we put it through a small bottleneck that we also regularize for batch normalization. And I can explain a couple of these. So the representation for clustering is that you want everything in a cluster to have roughly the same binarized code. Um, so there will be differences between these cells because the autoencoder has to reconstruct them. But if uh, when you binarize, they all get the same code, then you can decide that they're in the same, same cluster. And the way we encourage that is by um, penalizing the entropy, uh, the activation entropy. So when you penalize the activation entropy, you're kind of pretending that the activations of the nodes in a neural network are probabilities and you're using Shannon entropy. And that encourages low entropy activations that are easily, easily binarizable. So then <laughs> our activations were stored in more in the zero or one range and less in the middle. So there's a large range where you can cut them. Um, another problem we had was systematic batch effects that would create shifts between the data. And we wanted the data not to be organized by patient, but to be unified in terms of patient, but organized by cell type. So for this, we used a ma maximum mean discrepancy penalty, which lately has become very popular. There's some kind of MMD GAN now as well. Um, and after we add, this is a probability distribution penalty that you can compute at the batch level using a kernel for your epoch. You, you calculate it for each epoch of your neural network. And before MMD and after MMD, you see a drastic difference. Before, after the MMD regularization, this population sort of flipped and lined up so you can compare the cell types. And now you can see clean mass cellular manifolds where the patient signal is, is not visible. And now you have apples to apples comparisons of the patients. You can also see how the di disease in general affects acute, uh, acute infection, healthy and convalescent. What's the difference between convalescent and healthy? And these are questions that you can ask using the clustering. So the clustering came up with some very interesting cl subclusters of C T cells that started to hint to us about the connection between D Zika and Dengue. And one of them was these gamma delta T cells that are expressed in the acute clusters. Um, and so we took all of those clusters and created cluster, the, the cluster proportion uh, graphs that uh, were basically slicing and dicing the T cell population. And on the basis of the MMD that we'd already computed, we were able to make um, patient manifolds. So the, here now the patient, the distance between each patient is the MMD between their embedding. And this gives us a good distance between the patients. And now based on the location in the patient manifold, we can go back to the cellular cluster features to see what's determining those. So um, this was kind of an exciting foray into redoing everything we'd done, but in a super scalable manner. Um, so Saucy is the black one. The only thing faster than Saucy was randomized PCA. So all of these other methods were um, compared to are not of the same type. Some are visualization, some are batch normalization, and some are imputation. 
so that gives you a flavor of the manifold learning methods we use. We have a lot of other methods. So if you're interested in any of these or want to talk to me some more, um, feel free to contact me in, in any of these ways. Thanks to all of our collaborators, Guy Wolf from Montreal, uh, et cetera, um, people for free people at Yale. And finally, I am looking for students and postdocs. So let me know if you're interested. Um, any questions? Uh, should I just say thank you so much? And uh, that was fabulous. We still have, I mean, I'm, I don't have anywhere to be or go or do anything, so I'm happy to stick around. Uh, if anybody has any questions. I, saw, I see um, a couple of questions here in the chat, um, which I didn't see before. Um, so uh, Demet, I think, I don't know how to say it, uh, asked, so does RES to EES do the batch removal on its own, or does the batch normalization take care of that? Um, so you do have to batch normalize the data first, but um, we tried to give an option within the Laplacian for spectral translation. So if you think your batch effects largely captured by, for example, the first eigen dimension, you can spectrally translate uh, the, the signal over to ignore that dimension. But in general, um, batch normalization comes in all shapes and forms. So we do uh, batch normalize first before we create the graph. Um, and then I think it was the same person who asked, how would fate compare to spring? Okay. Um, spring is, um, I believe, a graph layout, which just spreads things apart. So it's like force directed layout. I, I believe it's some kind of wrapper around force directed layout. Um, force directed layout is different than what Fate is trying to do, which is trying to preserve manifold affinity. So in force directed layout, the idea is you have a graph and you're going to lay it out in sort of a spread out fashion so you can tell what the cliques are. It doesn't necessarily have any, uh, any kind of distances and, or things it's trying to preserve. My email address, first name dot last name at Yale. <laughs> it's everybody's email at Yale. I can type it here. Um, any other questions? Oh, actually, my email's on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to chime in with anything? I don't want to uh, who, who is take away on? the op Sorry, go ahead. We've got a bunch of people here from uh, biomedicine and health. So if uh, any of them want to um, I got one question. other question. How can we watch the recording? I will send um, the recording to, to Michael. W weirdly, I'm not allowed to record on the cloud, so there's not a cloud link. I'm going to upload it manually to Google Drive or something and send you a link, and maybe you can forward it to the group. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, you can uh, you can put it on YouTube or something. Oh, you... I could put it on YouTube. That's a good idea too. I'll if if you want to. Sure. And I was also uh, so somebody also was wondering, was wondering if these methods have been tested for proteomics data. Um, so I it depends on what you mean by proteomics. If you consider facts and cytoff data as proteomics, then yes. Um, if you're looking at other kinds of proteomics, you know, things where you're tagging proteins by, by antibodies or, or purifying proteins in some other way, usually the issue could be that there's not enough samples. Because remember, I started out saying these techniques were all for big data, which means you have a lot of observations. So it's very difficult to learn these dimensionalities and things like that of the data if you have very small sample sizes. Uh, I've got a quick question about uh, magic and some of the other, uh, <clears throat> and perhaps the use of Saucy for uh, kind of data imputation. So as a social scientist, one of the things that we deal with a lot um, is uh, systematic missingness. So for example, if I'm surveying people and I use some, you know, like app-based surveys or something on a phone, and then I can survey people all day, but never at night. And so if I want to do some kind of like manifold reconstruction method, like an embedding method or something like that, then I've got this every single day systematic missingness. So it's not noise, 
per se, right? So there's, you know, then you have these correlates of missingness um, and you know what they are. But then the question is, you know, for a method like magic, for example, or, uh, or, or the use of saucy for the same thing, uh, how do you deal with kind of known missingness when, you know, the causes of the missingness are known? Oh, okay, so so those those particular methods aren't specifically designed to address that problem, but right. uh, one approach where they could be used that way is you said you had covariate. So depending on how many features you have, uh, you can imagine creating some sort of a feature similarity. Um, so if you have all these patients and uh, you've collected not only some kind of night measurement on them, but all these day measurements, uh, you understand that the day measurements can um, some of on the basis of the people where you might actually have this, you might understand that the day measurements are similar similar to some other measurement um, or or whatever. Um, so you yep. can actually apply a lot of these techniques. And actually, Rafi Kaufman does this more than I do, where he does diffusion on the observations and the features. Um, or, or does the same kind of analysis on the observations, features, observations, features, kind of in an alternating fashion. It, it's mm. very interesting to, to explore, um, and, but we haven't done a specific amount of that because there is a, um, we haven't come across a lot of data where we have a lot of this, this kind of other dimensions being super reliable, but it, it's something we're, we're interested in. And another thing that we do for some of this imputation is trajectory net. So we're using trajectory net or neural ODEs of some sort for patient data. And there you, you can project out what, what it's gonna be on the basis or sort of trajectory. Mm. So that's more based on the time trajectory. That, yeah. Right. Uh, there are more questions here. How can parallel single cell measurements be looked at together with manifold methods? So I'm not sure what parallel means. If you mean multi-condition method, then um, MELD and SAUCY were pretty distinctly designed to do just that, to correct for batch and compare um, yeah, actually, conditions in the manifold. Yeah, actually, I meant like parallel uh, profiling of, say, two omics, say, ataxic and oh, yeah. since rna seq which is something that is uh, becoming plausible yeah so i didn't talk about this here but we're very interested in integrating these data sets and the basic principle there is manifold alignment um and so we're still working on these techniques but we do have a couple of interesting publications that might inspire you one is called megan manifold aligning gan was published in icml 2018 and very recently like a month ago uh we had a method called harmonic alignment which tries to find an alignment between the diffusion dimensions of the two kinds of data uh we tried ataxic and single cell RNA seq, um, and it it was published in Siam Data Mining. Um, but we're we're still working on it. We're actually trying to combine Megan, which is a GAN. It's a cycle GAN framework, so it tries to take a sample from one domain, transfer it to the other domain. So it would be like you take I don't know proteomics domain to gene domain or or something like that. But instead of transporting the actual cells or entities, we're trying to transport the dimensions of variation to combine our harmonic alignment and Megan. So we'll let you know how it goes, but you can for now read those papers if, you, if you'd like. Um, the next one, are your graphs in the original data space slash domain or in the kernel transform space or domain? So, so the, well, that's kind of a, a oddish question for me, but so so the graphs are made exactly how I showed you. They're made by taking distances and transforming it into a kernel. But I think that question might be getting at the kernel trick, which basically Mercer's theorem, which says that any any kernel is, is some kind of inner product in a different space. But of course, you never have to explicitly compute that space. Uh, I, I'm not sure. It might not have been what <laughs> what that person intended. Jing Xing Zhang. Um, so you can ask me again if I didn't say the right answer. Um, Joeri Moll is asking. Obviously, these techniques involve some fancy footwork. Are you aware which of these techniques are used in the fight against COVID? 
Um, I do actually. Um, it, it, I, I do know of some of these techniques. So we're right now collaborating with uh, a group of people in, in Montreal to try to map the sequences of different people and their uh, viral genome with a new variant of fate called a hierarchical fate. Uh, we have a bunch of data from Yale New Haven Hospital that's longitudinal data longitudinal facts and a whole bunch of lab measurements. So we're trying to use some of our dynamic techniques as well as MELD for that. Um, I know other, other people have also been trying to use FATE and other, other techniques for that. Um, any, any other questions? But um, if you're interested in using any of these techniques uh, for COVID, I mean, I've also been sort of advising some people, uh, some people want to do some interesting things like even, uh, you know, look at Twitter data or social network data. Um, so some of my students have wanted to do that, but uh, I'd, I'd be happy to suggest techniques for, for use. Okay, great. Right. Thank you so Thank much, you. Smita. Uh, should we wrap up here? That's okay, sounds good. plenty of plenty. Yeah, thank you so much. I, it's 11.15 yeah, for you. Yeah, no, I just heard that. <laughs> One of my kids just woke, woke up again, so I should probably go see what's going on with them. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank good, you so much. Good morning, good afternoon. Yeah, right. <laughs> thank you, Smita. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.